Well, uh, what a lovely way to end uh, with Gus, who is actually the original <laughs> and uh, mainspring of, uh, of this drive in the UK, as I said earlier today. Uh, he is actually, to me, the knight in shining armour, I, I thought I should say the lord in shining armour, um, of this movement. Uh, when he was cabinet secretary, uh, as you know, um, he, uh, with uh, the help of his prime minister, uh, introduced uh, the measurement of well-being in the first country in the world. Um, he pushed mental health very strongly, and then since he's been cabinet secretary, uh, he's kept on with this as his uh, main, I think I can say that, your, your main lifetime mm. campaign, um, which is absolutely wonderful for all of us. Um, he chaired the committee, and I've been praising the committee, but I'll remind you of it, Wellbeing and Policy, on the Legatum uh, website, um, which, which Gus chaired, and which is, is the nearest to a Bible that we have on this subject of, of well-being uh, and, and policy. Um, so, um, Gus, tell us what, what your latest thoughts are. Hi. <coughs> I'll, I'll stand up, if I may, and uh, I'll try and give, give some time for questions at the end. But I thought it would be quite useful to say where the whole area of well-being is going and the kinds of interests there are from different groups around the world. But let's start with the UK. So this morning, uh, I was talking to a group of chairmen of company boards about well-being and how they could ask what questions they should be asking of their management to address the question of well-being in companies, of their employees, but also of their customers. And it's very interesting. So they're now thinking about what constitutes success for a company, right? In the old days, us economists would say, well, they maximize profits, it's quite straightforward. Now, if you ask that question, they'd say, well, we look after all of our stakeholders. Well, what does that mean? Uh, and two obvious stakeholders are their customers and their employees. So if you think about customers, when the banks were selling PPI to their customers, were they enhancing their well-being? Uh, pretty straightforward question. If someone had asked that question, that would have saved them billions of pounds. So this is very real to them, right? And those things which companies are trying to think about, how they maintain a long-term sustainable competitive advantage, they're thinking about things which will actually appeal to customers over the long term, not short term. And, and will be regarded in a good way so that, for example, they won't have to modify their products if they've got too much sugar in them, for example, and be uh, on the end of a, a punitive tax or a regulatory restriction if you're Uber, for example, you know, all those sorts of things. So that's quite interesting that they're all interested in that. And then from the employee side, they come at it in a very hard-headed way because I think some of the work that you've been, and I had the whole panel pack, actually, which I stole with pride this morning, to talk about the increases in productivity that come with this. And we had a, a really interesting question about causation. <laughs> the question that, that was put to me was uh, this morning was, um, uh, someone said, um, well, happier people have more sex, but is that because they're having more sex that they're happier? So which way does the causation go? And it was very interesting. They don't quite use the language of causation, but they're getting there. And so I was able to explain some of the experimental ways, and I'm sure Jan went, went into this, as to how we solve those causation questions so they're not just correlations. Interesting, a company like Rolls-Royce are talking about they have gold, silver, and bronze uh, production facilities in terms of the well-being levels in those production facilities. They're thinking about how they improve the well-being of their staff, and interestingly, they come up this mind-bogglingly complicated thing, which is they ask them. And, and since I had the privilege of chairing a company called Frontier Economics, this is exactly what we do. But we're smaller. We have about 200 economists, which some of you might think of as a complete nightmare to manage, and at times it is. Um, but they're all. They're, they're, we're, what we're putting to them is asking them questions about well-being. What is it that actually would improve your well-being at work? And the first thing that you do when you do that sort of thing is 
you realise that the board cares. I'm the chairman. The board wants to know. The management wants to know. What, uh, this is what matters to us, uh, but it also matters to the firm because if you're happy, you're going to stay with us, we retain you, um, you will be more productive. And interestingly, it gives you nuances in like little things which, which you would think were straightforward about hours worked. And I can and talk to this because I have a wonderful example of someone I know who's very close to me who works in the civil service now in the fast stream. And She's gone through various jobs, which, to be honest, some of them have been incredibly boring. Uh, and she's kind of gone, oh my god, what, what did I let myself in for here? And now she's got a job which is incredibly interesting. So she's working much longer hours and is much happier. She's much more satisfied, her life is much more worthwhile. And so that simple correlation between hours worked and uh, satisfaction is not quite there. But in front here, what we've observed, what we've asked people, they're really interested in, in a project. They finish their project. The adrenaline goes down. And what we do now is we can't almost enforce time off for them. So they have a break. So they don't overdo the work-life balance. They get more time with their family. And so there are, there are ways you can do this. And when you break it down, the whole hours thing is a really interesting thing. And actually, being able to think about more flexible ways of working, but also asking people, what are the things that will make a difference to your life? And it might just be more showers, it might be places to leave the bike, it might be actually I'd like my boss to talk to me at times when I'm doing well, not just when I'm doing badly, which is a kind of classic. If you, The well-being results, which are horrible for management about what's one of your worst times commuting and being in the same room as my boss. I mean. Um, and that shows you that bosses, and actually looking out at all of you, you're almost certainly all bosses. Um, what was, when was the last time you brought someone in uh, to talk to them that's working for you to say, actually, you're doing a fantastic job, you did that really well, as opposed to, actually, you didn't quite get that right, and maybe um, calling the minister by his first name didn't really work that well, but, you know. So I think there are things there that companies are getting to. Uh, in terms of global interest, it's there. Um, I think we're, we're going to do UAE next year. Um, uh, I'm going out to New Zealand where they're they really looking at well-being as the focus. It's, it's even in the Treasury's objectives in New Zealand. Uh, uh, and they're beginning to think, I think a lot more countries around the world are beginning to think, actually, this is something quite big. It's very interesting that when you look at the world, um, I have a, a bottle of vintage sake given to me by the nudge team in Japan. They mm. just set up a nudge team, Japanese government. Um, interestingly, they, they look at this behavioral stuff, so, oh yeah, everyone's saying behavioral stuff, this is great. Um, I say, well, why are you changing behavior? You're pushing the measure up and volunteering, having absolutely no impact on it, you know that. It's not a welfare, me it's not a measure of well-being. It's a crazy measure, and it uses really weird distributional assumptions, i.e. that distribution doesn't really matter. So, so the economists I know will know all of these things, and yet, and yet, GDP numbers, you know, regularly get, we're up 0.1. So what? You know, well, I'm really fascinated by why over the last four years well-being has been going up, and that's a really interesting question for me. Uh, and. I suspect a lot of it is to do with some of the technological developments that don't go anywhere near GDP. When you think about how all of the things we do are on the internet, and this is what a lot of the, the work that the Indigo Prize is related to don't really show up at all, uh, then I think there are things which, if you think about the things which have made my life better, saved me time, um, got me to places on time when they work, like Google Maps, uh, there's this amazing number of things that can improve your quality of life. Um, lonely uh, grandparents who can Skype their kids. So explain to me where that shows up in the GDP numbers. Um, it doesn't. Skype's free. Uh, so it won't be there. So there's huge numbers of things which are going on which are not picked up when we're talking about success in society. Now, when we come to the point of you, government policy, it's really important that we get to this. Now, I know you've gone through the determinants and all the rest of it, but you look at some of the things we're doing. So, HS2, uh, nine, I'm 
and God knows how many billion. I, I don't know, it keeps going up. Um, if you did a well-being analysis of HS2, would you do it? Um, we all know the answer to that. If you did a well-being analysis of Pinkley Point, would you do it? Oh, yeah, come on. Um, if you did a well-being analysis of the Olympics, um, interesting. Take the first bid of, I think it was 2.6 billion, or the last bid of 9.2 billion, would you do it? It would require you to start thinking about the value you place upon uh, the joy you get from watching uh, Mo Farah win a gold medal. Uh, you would have to think about what sustainable change has that made to exercise habits uh, in the UK, which might well feed through to well-being. Answer, not that much, I'm afraid. Um, I'm sure DCMS here. Yeah, not that much, would you agree? Okay, maybe some, maybe some positives there, but um, <coughs> the nine billion, uh, you could probably have done better. Uh, so I think there are a lot of really interesting questions there. Now, people say to me, uh, oh, it's all very difficult, it's fluffy. It's not fluffy. Uh, we know it's not fluffy. You've, you've heard enough today to know it's not fluffy. Uh, yes, we're looking at subjective measures, but for goodness sake, we, we all know that uh, there are lots of things in, in the world we deal with which are subjective. We have some really interesting, difficult questions about comparisons between individuals. Are we trying to put overall well-being up or are we trying to reduce the, the inequality in well-being? And I, for one, think that there's a very good case for thinking uh, about those policy interventions which really do reduce the inequality of well-being by bringing up the bottom end, which, is, which takes you to the whole mental health agenda. I think those are very, very powerful things. Um, I do have a diminishing marginal utility of well-being in there, so I'm not that interested in getting the nines up to ten as I am getting the threes up to four, and I think that's hugely important. I think that you have to take that into account when you do the practical analysis of what's important. But, um, and, and you might think, well, in government it's not happening all that much. Well, you know, I remember times when I came into the Treasury a long time ago to the government, 1979, one of the first things I was doing with a guy called Norman Glass was looking at the use of the Green Book for uh, cost-benefit analysis. It's gone off. Um, and uh, we found that, uh, actually we, we put this lovely detailed guidance out there, it was hardly ever being used. There were all sorts of projects where it should have been a cost-benefit analysis and they weren't doing it at all. Um, so I think that's changed. If you look at, say, transport, basically cost-benefit analysis is routine. Um, we're talking about relatively simple steps to move from cost-benefit analysis to a well-being analysis, and we're now starting to get the uh, metrics that you would require for valuation and the like. Um, not quite there yet, yet but, but I think we're a long way down the road, and you can kind of work out, well, what kind of values would you have to put on these numbers to make this option better than that option in terms of well-being? It's routinely accepted in health, qualities. Uh, quality adjusted life years, we use it all the time. Uh, those people say, well, it will never be operationalized. It's already being used quite, quite comprehensively there. And you could extend that in various ways. So I think there are lots of things um, we could be doing. Um, I hope today you've had some examples of, of, of how to manage this process and how important it is. I'll just say this is, to my mind, this is about measuring success, success of government policies, how much is our policy making a difference to individuals' lives, to our corporate performance, uh, and to uh, the overall success of the economy. If you look at some of the things, I was talking to Andy Haldane about the, the productivity puzzle. Quite a lot of the productivity puzzle is probably about outputs we're not measuring uh, and about what kinds of, what, what constitutes output, uh, as well as, you know, if you're measuring output per man hour of labor, well, clearly, um, y you're going to have problems comparing the UK and France, because in France, they're going to work a lot fewer hours. As a result of that, for every hour is almost certainly going to be more productive. They'll be happier because they've got more time doing other things, a bit more variety to their life. And of course, if you've got, if you're French with the system that Macron's trying to change, it's very hard to hire and fire people. So basically, you're going to use capital rather than labor. So you're going to have a higher capital labor ratio. So obviously, you can explain quite a lot of that 28% gap in productivity throughout. But there's another part which is saying, so what's the output? How valuable is that? 
is that actually enhancing individual well-being? Is it doing things that we really care about, or is it selling PPI or a whole host of things which actually, you know, you begin to wonder whether uh, we're giving people the right incentives uh, to do the right sorts of things, and, and that's based on good science about I've been talking, uh, interestingly at Frontier, we've been talking about one of our big clients is Tesco's, about how do we encourage healthy eating and how do we encourage people uh, to take a well-being analysis to all of this and manage issues of, uh, a lot of behavioral issues about you know, where we put things on shelves, but also how do we give people the information and sometimes give them that sort of ability to make constrained decisions in a way that's in their long-term benefit where short term in the shop they might make the wrong decision that they regret later so there's a whole host of things there which I think bringing together well-being analysis with some really interesting understanding of how humans make decisions and their behavior and how to change their behavior with the ultimate goal of enhancing people's well-being uh, that I think could create the agenda for what governments should be doing in the next 20 years. And that's what Richard and I and Jan and all the others in this room have been trying to do. And I, I wish you the very best in achieving all of that because you will be the people at the front line doing it on policy terms. So with that, I think, why don't we move to questions so I can kind of uh, find out what it is that you think is holding you back and suggestion ways to uh, get past those obstacles. Okay, now I'm going to be told that the Olympics was wonderful in baseball. <laughs> I wasn't going to go there. Okay. Um, Amy Coleman from the Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport. Um, so um, I just wondered, how much traction do you think is in UK Treasury for these ideas at the moment? So I think uh, traction amongst UK government is uh, dominated by Brexit. Let's do a well-being analysis of that. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? Um, uh, I think the intellectually... They're, uh, they're moving that way because the economics profession is moving that way and Treasury is very economics dominated, as you know. I think you saw the, the fact that, which was quite interesting to me of the, on the economics journal, uh, the fact that when I did that wellbeing report, it was with uh, Angus Deaton, not how I got news Angus Deaton, but the Angus Deaton that won the Nobel Prize in economics. You're beginning to see this is changing the profession and changing what's important. So uh, I think that Treasury uh, is, as ever, a uh, kind of relatively small department trying to do an enormous amount, and uh, they find it hard to stand back. I think when they do, and I've talked to Tom Scholar about this, I think they will, uh, they will embrace this, but at the moment they're nervous and they're kind of... Uh, rapidly doing this, trying to keep up with what's an area that they really haven't spent any time doing on uh, analysis of uh, trade and single market stuff. It's not, not the thing that they've had to do much of. So they are a bit pushed at the minute. But I'd like to think post-Brexit, is there a world post-Brexit? Uh, <laughs> and we're in that world. Uh, and if you're, uh, Theresa May as a Prime Minister, you're trying to to define what constitutes an agenda which isn't Brexit. I think everyone in the world is going to be bored stupid with Brexit, right? How do you have an agenda? She's talking about not being the nasty party and all those sorts of things. Actually embracing the well-being idea gives you the policies, the, 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 the actual facts that will, I think, appeal to people and be politically rather popular. Uh, I'm sure Richard pointed out that if you uh, increase well-being then incumbent governments do rather well in, in polls. So there's political gains to this. Um, but we're not there yet. Work in progress. Next. Um, can I ask, from your experience of working kind of within the research field and within the civil service, how you think the best model for academic engagement, especially on this topic, would work? Um, we were invited earlier to uh, submit papers to a seminar, to a regular series of seminars, yeah. and I think nobody will mind me admitting that nobody put their hand up to volunteer one. Um, 
Do you think that that's because the civil service isn't good at making space for economists or for other analyst, analysts to publish in their own profession, or is there another barriers that we need to overcome? Uh, I think the... I mean, you can easily... Do, first of all, you can easily do a paper without necessarily publishing it, right? So um, we could... If you, uh, Richard told me about the idea of, of having seminars, which I think would be fascinating to be able to help, have some of us help you in terms of how might you apply this, uh, and it would be not necessarily for an academic publication, but for actual use in policy work, you know, so addressing the issue of how might you tackle specific questions, how might you put in a, a bid to the Treasury on a, on a well-being level, for example, uh, as part of your uh, next public expenditure round, you know, showing that these things had huge gains and the reprioritization that was necessary in, for example, areas like health. So I think that, that would be good. Um, I don't think it particularly raises any difficult issues uh, <coughs> which aren't there already in, in, you know, doing standard policy work where you're doing a cost-benefit analysis, which I would say is actually a sub subtext of a well-being analysis, just you're not quite getting it right, you know. This is the last question. Uh, Simon Strickland, Cabinet Office. Um, you mentioned Brexit, but could you comment more generally on the use of well-being analysis for international policy evaluation, as distinct from the domestic field, which we've heard a lot about, of course, today? Sure, sure. Uh, and I think this is this is really interesting. When you think about so this guy called Amar Breckenridge at Frontier did some work on uh, of uh, relevance to trying to analyse uh, foreign policy and various aspects of, of work, preventing wars, that sort of thing. Uh, I think that this is a very big area to get into. Um, when we think about foreign policy actions, be they diplomacy, be they um, aid, uh, I think we've got a kind of old-fashioned model when we think about these things, and there's some need for, for some really interesting thought. I think in particular, when you think about the size of our aid budget, um, so is that enhancing well-being? Uh, have we done that analysis uh, properly? I'm nervous about that. So uh, also when you think about how we alloc... When we think about a foreign policy response, be it diplomatic, uh, foreign policy, or defence, you know, when I think about looking back on Libya, um, sitting around the table with the Prime Minister and all the uh, ministers in the National Security uh, Council, did we really think about the well-being of Libya uh, and the people there in our interventions? Did we? I suspect when we look back on these things, we'll find that there's, you know, Iraq would be another example, where there's there's f far too much spent right up front on. You think of the military intervention. You know, you, you know, a, a, a million per smart bomb. You you are spending a lot of money very very quickly, versus how much we spend on helping the post crisis, governance structure, um, getting some sort of government and helping that government rebuild and uh, create cohesion and unity in, in the new country. So I think there is a lot of scope to do this and um, it requires a bit of imagination, a bit of creativity, but I think there's going to be more and more emphasis on departments, individual civil servants, proving that policies really make a difference in a way that's comparable across different areas. Right. Okay. So <laughs> um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gas, and thank you to all our speakers earlier. We've got dotted around at the front. I hope you agree it's been a really varied and interesting day, and we had some really useful discussions in the in the breakout session earlier. And I have one last round of applause for all our speakers and those who've been part of the sessions today. <laughs> but I would also like to say a huge thank you to you for being here today, being part of this conversa conversation. It is really exciting to see so many of you from so many different departments, organisations,
being part of this discussion and really wanting to make a difference in your area, in your department, in your policies. And so please stay in touch. As I mentioned, we, we have added you to the mailing list and we'll give you the option to opt out for the upcoming evidence alerts. And we will also send you an evaluation form. Please do take the time to fill that in. It'll be really useful for us to know where we pitch things and what some of the next steps are for the learning in this area. So once again, thank you to you and look forward to having a further conversation in the future. Thank you. Thank you, to the thank you to the Centre for organising this. The last thing is drop, make sure you drop your badges off on the box outside as you, as you leave. Yeah,